um, Covishield vaccine, which was um, which was manufactured at scale um, at the CERN Institute here in India. There's defence ambitions, and there's also development ambitions. And we were really pleased that Foreign Secretary Quatra hosted our Permanent Undersecretary, Philip Barton, the head of the Foreign Office, a couple of weeks ago, and they recommitted to this document, and, and therefore all of our cooperation is really stemming from this, um, this significant ambition to do more by 2030. And so, in terms of our uh, bilateral relationship, it's very, it's very obvious why that's important, but it's worth saying it's going from strength to strength. And so, uh, for example, we now have a young professional scheme, uh, which was recently launched, which provides an opportunity for the youth of both countries to live and work in, in either country. So there'll be 3,000 um, spaces for Indian and British uh, citizens to enroll in that scheme opening up. Uh, we have uh, FTA negotiations, so free trade negotiations, which will unlock uh, more investment and trade um, in the relationship, and this builds on the enhanced trade partnership that already exists. And we've also got uh, investment through the, uh, through the BII, which is our development finance new organization to, um, to invest significantly in climate-related projects in India over the upcoming years. And it's worth making the point that this relationship is underpin underpinned by a shared commitment to democracy and freedoms, multilateralism, multilateralism and crucially the rules-based international order, which is of vital importance to both the UK and India. And I want to touch upon two areas in particular. As I said, my colleague Natasha will speak to what we're doing in the Indo-Pacific as a whole, but two areas where the UK and India are really kind of pioneering our um, cooperation, getting it to the next level and having an effect in the region as a whole by working together. The first is on the development side where we've announced a very exciting initiative called the Global Innovation Partnership, which is a really novel development cooperation initiative in which the UK and India have agreed to co-finance up to 100 million US dollars to support and uh, to support the transfer and scale of innovations to third countries to develop development and climate goals. So that's the UK and India working together to take fantastic innovations and scale them out on the region to support our wider objectives in the Indo-Pacific region. And the second area is maritime cooperation, which is an area close to my heart, um, given that I'm the, I'm the lead for that policy area in, in New Delhi uh, for the British High Commission. And here we have, uh, we have ship visits and joint exercises really taking off and becoming uh, very commonplace. So most notably, we had the visit of the UK's carrier strike group to India in July 2021, where it concluded a tri-state exercise, uh, sorry, a, um, yeah, so a, uh, an exercise with all three elements of the, of the Indian military. Uh, I think that was only the third country to, to have that level of cooperation with India. And most recently, the visit of HMS Tamar, uh, to the Andaman Islands, which was uh, the, the site of our, of our recent round table. We also have a liaison officer who's permanently stationed um, in Kagawa working with the Indian Navy on, uh, and other partners on maritime issues. And the UK is really proud to be the co-lead of the maritime security pillar of, which is Prime, which is Prime Minister Modi's um, which is part of Prime Minister Modi's Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative. And we have an exciting proposal in this space which will seem to be announced, which I think will really turbocharge our cooperation in the region. And look forward to, to sharing that with you shortly. So I just want to conclude um, by again thanking uh, the university for hosting this, this discussion and also thanking Asian Confluence for hosting uh, the discussion in the, that happened this weekend in the beautiful setting of Port Blair. I learned that the Andamans are not only stunning uh, with fantastic tourism opportunities, but also hugely strategically significant for the region. Uh, it's been called India's unsinkable aircraft carrier, uh, and it's only a thousand kilometers from the Straits of Malacca, that vital uh, trading position. And it's a reminder, it was a reminder to me of why India instinctively looks east. Uh, and it was fascinating to hear about the development plans, uh, both with regard to, to defence capability, but also uh, in terms of investment into sustainable, climate-friendly tourism, uh, where there is clearly so much potential. So thank you. 
thank you uh, very much uh, mr rosh uh, in fact uh, he has led bear the the entirety of uh, india and great britain's uh, relations and how that possibly now can be also situated from the prism of uh, the growing convergences in the world on the primacy of indo pacific region uh, it's most welcome contribution and then as he mentioned that in the afternoon uh, two of his colleagues uh, one from london and another from uh, delhi office they are also going to make uh, a, a more detailed presentation on the british approach and policy on indo pacific and the areas of convergences that uh, the preeminent country in the region that is uh, our country india and britain uh, have in common now we can uh, move on to uh, dr sridhar dotto uh she is an established scholar on the subject area and much before uh, uh, this indo pacific coinage uh, the last 5 to 10 years came about so he she has been working on areas which are the essential building block in relationship to our understanding and our possible uh, approach and contribution to indo pacific dr dotto thank you uh, professor mishra professor kalyan raman and uh, uh, imon uh, and all the familiar faces and friends that i see in the hall it's always a privilege and pleasure to be back in this uh, university it's uh, it's this home coming for me always uh, uh i mean in the pacific is i think uh, the latest buzzword i mean there are no aspects in international relations that we can discuss which doesn't join in uh, you know the indo pacific construct of course we are aware of the fact that uh, the main players as we always understood in the indo pacific construct was usa australia uh, britain france uh, indonesia and japan uh, which of course also stretch from the connect that we see in the southeast asia philippines and mongolia and but one of the most interesting uh, entrance to this indo pacific construct has been in recent times south korea and that has also been a kind of aligning point for uh, many of us to look at this a little more closely uh, for the next few minutes what i'll do is i'll try to look at the indo pacific construct through the indian prism and also bring in south uh, bring in south asia and i think uh, north east and uh, relevance to east india and i'll finish off in the next 15 or 20 minutes looking at uh, the challenges and i think it is something very important and relevant for us to uh, discuss and take forward we have also seen that over the years i mean there has been uh, i think um, this was in 2006 and 2007 that we found um, president abe in india uh, speaking at indian parliament and he talked about the conference of two seas uh, which was understood in fact that was a take away from our old archival work and how um, indian ocean and asia pacific uh, was a space of combination uh from there that journey where of course as you know for very long india preferred to uh keep the terms strictly asia pacific and indian ocean uh the sensitivities i think for all of you from ia students here were you aware of it it is only recently and i think it was as late as 2016 that india revamped the ministry of external affairs uh and the south asia um section and others were kind of broken and rearranged to have a ior which is indian ocean region and in fact uh, uh, sri lanka uh, maldives seychelles mauritius for the latest entry in that 2016 which was a beginning to our looking at this region through a different lens uh, of course i think as later 2018 we find madagascar being included and some of the other uh, smaller uh, you know islands of the region uh, we've seen for years and i think uh, there is of course as we are aware of the fact that there has been over the years uh, given that india's uh, uh, 
we of course live in a world of convergence and divergence issues where we are no more uh, looking at a full on platform we are looking at uh, converging on issue based issue uh, you know with every national partner and we are of course aware of the divergence and i think the point that uh, was made by mr ross recently is of course you know there are points of friction uh, but i think every nation state is grappling with those issues and i'll also refer to that some extent uh, for india i think the indo pacific was one of the ways to reach out uh, it's kind of without of course as i said the definition came in much later but it was a way of reaching out it was also a way of ensuring and i think that they did that pretty purposefully uh, that they were not going to be a kind of a alliance partner at the same time but also uh, be kind of a lead voice for the smaller nations in the indian ocean i think that's a point that prime minister modi has been making on and off and uh, the fact that it was i think as late as 2015 2016 the us uh, constantly and of course we are aware of the fact that uh, it was 2011 that um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton talked about how India is looking east needs also to act east, and we kind of started re-examining the act east and coined it act east in 2014 onwards, and uh, re-examine the relationship uh, with Southeast Asia, but more through the prism of northeast and northeast as a connecting uh, zone between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, we've just heard in the morning Sabha Satya Niyam may talk about the Andaman Nicobar, which again. for a variety of reasons uh, a of course ecology and b security that india had fallen back on you know uh, making that a part of the framework it's only now that there is a very very uh, um, strong robust initiative to ensure uh, how that can also and i think that is one of the strongest pillar of atlas policy uh, but again as we know that this whole uh, construct of how this falls into the indo pacific uh, it only happened i think with the shangri la dialogue where uh, for the first time in india we see prime minister modi actually articulating indian position uh, and you know saying what it meant uh, so while it was quite clear and for i mean for years for decades we've seen that india has always been very very reticent and hesitant to kind of club itself with any of the major powers uh, while at a bilateral level i think there has been you know a lot of context with all the major powers uh, in this but 2018 was actually a, a kind of a acceptance and understanding of the fact that there is a major power realignment taking place uh, and india was going to play a strong role there so that was something that you know we understood at you know it's only as late as that uh, we've also seen how um, you know there has been uh, in india it's very interesting that we rarely ever have anything what's known as a white paper it so it is only these speeches that we have whether it's a prime minister or whether it's a, you know ministry of foreign affairs external affairs as we call it or other leaders who kind of uh, you know um, sketch out what a policy is but in recent times i think we've seen a minister of external affairs uh, uh, being very very articulate on this position which wasn't the case earlier uh, that of course again explains a kind of a completely uh, you know uh, a new look that india is positioning itself as and india uh, indo pacific construct is also about that uh, they want to leverage the extended region the extended outreach and they also want to leverage the kind of partnership that they've developed at the bilateral level now flowing into a much more regional space uh, again while we struggle with this we also are aware of the fact that again bilateral uh, partnerships uh, kind of assume uh, the highest priority in all nation state and their interaction and engagement uh, but there is a very specific and i think the specific point here while i would also ensure i mean add the fact that indo pacific while there is a huge strategic and a security connotation to this particular space that's been created and something that every nation state relates to there is also an large economic pillar to that uh, which is something that india has been constantly uh, you know uh, flashing that point uh, it is as i said limited to um, a bilateral construct for most of the period but in recent times you've seen how japan who has again uh, japan and india for again for long has had a very very close partnership at the bilateral level for the first time in the history of south asia uh, to uh, japan and india have actually worked closely with a third country which is bangladesh and been able to build their uh, uh, 
you know, the metro railway as we call it. Uh, the, the kind of partnership that Japan has with India on the Northeast is completely unprecedented. Uh, we are, in fact, we've been hesitant to even allow Indians into Northeast. Uh, but when it came to Japan, we've been able to open up our, you know, vistas of cooperation with them. So Japan, of course, had been somebody who's been constantly pushing India into this Indo-Pacific construct. Uh, but of course, as we are all aware of the fact that it was only in 2013 when uh, China floated its uh, Belt Road Initiative uh, when things started looking a bit different. Uh, it was, I think, in 2017 that CPEC came into place. And India, I think, uh, looked at it very differently when issues, of, as you're aware, the, um, the corridor went through, you know, uh, what we have questionable issues of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And that was the point when India, of course, uh, took a different and I think started reformulating its position on Indo-Pacific and how uh, from a completely economic prism to uh, what is now looking la more like a stra larger strategic vision of the region. Uh, of course, it's again post-2018, 2019, 2021, we've seen how difficult Indo-China relation has been. And I think while, uh, you know, they, that may not have been the core point of Indo-Pacific, but there is, I think, a very commonly understood uh, aspect of Indo-Pacific is that how all, all the nation states in this construct is kind of coming together to form a bulwark of uh, enterprise um, against the initiatives and endeavors that China is doing into making severe and strong inroads all over globally. Uh, but for us, at that point of time, it was something that we re-examined our relationship with the South Asia. Uh, as all of you are aware, from 2014 uh, and 20, yeah, 2014, we had India neighborhood first a policy, a strong policy through which we examined uh, the neighbors and, of course, act. East. Uh, Act East was all about bringing South Asia and Southeast Asia together and making uh, Northeast a uh, uh, you know, uh, very strong and robust player in that. And of course, there has been the kind of um, progression in terms of uh, regional initiatives at bilateral level and in terms of connectivity corridors has been unprecedented in the last few years. Uh, We've seen in, in the time when CPEC got completed and other BRI were taking place, India had a lot of difficult, um, uh, had kind of difficult situation with both Sri Lanka at that point of time. There was a um, government which wasn't very um, looking, engaging with India too much. China was a large development partner. China for years, for decades, has been a very long development partner in the South Asia. It's not been, in fact, one of our uh, fellow colleagues uh, calls China not resident South Asian power because of the fact that for years we've seen, whether it was defense, whether it was infrastructure, a variety of um, activities and initiatives uh, China has been part of. But the security and strategic component has obviously gathered momentum over the days and we've seen uh, the kind of intrusion we feel that they've done and of course as we speak just now uh, one of the main causes uh, of Sri Lanka's economic turn down has been China as we know Haman Tota of course is a case in point but not only that uh, there are several other uh, such infrastructure projects which has fallen flat on its place in fact on the BRI uh, of all the amount that was promised to all the neighbors which included Nepal specifically Sri Lanka uh, uh, Maldives and Bangladesh. Uh, Pakistan, in fact, has been lucky to receive most of its uh, funds on the BRI, uh, majority of it, but not so for the other countries. And so there was again a kind of rethinking happening. And the first time we see India, which began with India Bangladesh cooperation, uh, is cross border transport infrastructure facilities being, uh, you know, put in place. Uh, this is a way of recreating what the subcontinent looked at in the pre 65, uh, 1965, before uh, the bifurcation of uh, Pakistan and the you know birth of Bangladesh when all those uh, road transport and uh, other connectivity corridors were completely shut down. Uh, India Bangladesh I would say has been a pivot in the way the neighborhood has. I, of course I also caution to add that while we are talking about how South Asia and Southeast Asia is connecting through the Northeast and in this whole Indo-Pacific uh, construct where Southeast Asian players are very strong for us as partnership uh, uh, nation state members here. We've also seen there were many, many dissonance that was taking place in uh, South Asia. Uh, 
we have talked about uh, a sub region which is again under the sark that bangladesh bhutan india nepal we, we signed a motor vehicle agreement in 2015 uh, as we speak just now it's still yet to be operationalized uh, the challenges in the region are many uh, and i think while there is a larger construct a larger vision in place and i think india for the first time has shared its earlier inhibitions and his uh, hesitancy to be clubbed together in kind of a large construct like this which obviously has huge strategic and security uh, you know parameters uh, but also we've seen that while uh, there is of course if you compare what was in 1991 when the economy is in south asia i'll close in okay uh, liberalized to what it is now there has been a long road ahead yes there has been huge progress but i think the challenges are many here uh, we discuss northeast often and we were just back from port blair we've seen the problems of also engaging with the northeast while india southeast asia is doing wonderfully well i still have my reservations about how northeast is a uh, you know prominent player we are really using northeast as a transit point just now how northeast economy is going to contribute to this whole bio bengal community that we are uh, is something a case in point we've also talked about bimstech which is again part of being you know uh, this indo we construct uh, while at certain level there has been some kind of a activity uh, bimstech is still not a word which has you know captured the imagination of the people uh, we are aware of the fact as to why the main quad players are extremely upbeat about india's role there because indo pacific construct i believe does not exist without india pillar and i think that is the main reason but i think uh, i'll close here because i think we need to get into the q and a but the point is that while there is a vision in place i think for all of us it's important that we address the challenges which are many and i'll just close in with one thing that i remember hearing raja mohan talk about recently that uh, it's a fact that you know we have transitioned into a decade into a generation now where the argument uh, the power of the argument has diluted into the argument of power so the power matrix is something very important very clear to all of us but until unless we have a security strategic framework in place alongside addressing all the ground realities which is very difficult actually uh, when it comes to the brass tacks we will be unable to deliver the promise of indo pacific construct thank you very much uh, thank you dr datta for this uh, competent and comprehensive presentation now uh, we are in a mood to invite few questions if there are any yes prasad mohimdar no, i would just uh, like to uh, ask mr ross okay uh, mr ross can you hear me uh, the idea is uh, there are reports that the uk is uh, buying oil from indian refineries and i think uh, this is russian crude oil actually being refined in india anyone else uh, uh, yeah uh, i have a question for ma'am uh, ma'am with uh, regard to the way in which you have explained the entire uh, geopolitical and geostrategic uh, you know, framework of the indo pacific and in this regard would you assign any special role to the anc that is the andaman and nicobar command uh, as what india's first uh, theater command and uh, the way in which it may in future foment the malacca dilemma even further uh, would, you, would, you like to, would you would you like to shed some light on yeah go ahead uh -huh. 
Um, in fact, uh, initially when Iman told me to speak about on the pro on this subject for one hour, which was reduced to a few minutes, thanks to uh, the rescheduling. Uh, so I obviously missed out a lot of issues that I wanted to touch upon was. But I think this is a uh, uh, at the I think. Um, at the Indo-Pacific, the Indian Navy was the first one who actually played a major role. I mean, that entire thing started with the HADR exercises and even today the Malabar exercise and all of that. So in the conversation, which I didn't want to touch upon this morning at Indaman Nicobar, uh, my main issue was actually about security and strategy. Uh, because without that, everything else uh, collapses. And I, I just said that we at the Indo-Pacific construct or even at the smaller construct, uh, while at the bilateral level, and again, I didn't touch upon so much on the challenges, whether it's the Ukraine or whether it's other issue-based issues that we have with both UK, US, and all other major players in the Pacific. I think I am convinced of the fact that there is nothing can be done without a strategic framework in place. Uh, we need to understand how each one kind of takes care of the other. Uh, there's often been a talk about how at the Indo-Pacific there is no kind of an institute, right? Uh, but it doesn't matter. I don't think that's important, but the important here, and ANC comes in a really strong role here, because while, of course, we talked about how there's been development, there's been the ANC that you saw 20 years ago is not the ANC now. There's lots of, sub, you know, initiative on tourism, on green energy, uh, maritime, of course, and all of that. Uh, but again, the key role is, of course, the tribe force which is there and I think without that being taken into place nothing else would come in and it is because of the security forces the way that India has and we've seen how we've had a very very strong uh, defense uh, armed force in India and ANC here given the entire space of how it's close in terms of both the Southeast Asian reach as well on the other side has a critical and I think while it's very important to understand other people to people and other soft roles but ANC's main I think think, uh, you know, contribution to this construct is a security and uh, strategic um, po uh, positioning, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more Hi, uh, my name is Ritu Bhutti. Um, first of all, welcome to both of you. I think you guys both uh, had a nice seminar yesterday. My question is actually for Mr. Ross. Um, I'm just uh, trying to join whatever ma'am has said regarding that uh, the threat uh, China is giving to the uh, rest of the world and especially to India. And uh, uh, my question is actually, uh, you know, uh, recently two spy balloons that came up in um, USA sky and th both of them had been shut down. And on other hand, you spoke about the free trade. Do we really, I mean, do Britain or uh, do uh, um, uh, British Deputy High Commission or whoever that is, uh, you know, the related to the uh, decision making, do we really need to go through that uh, nine levels or ten levels of discussion regarding taking the f FTA uh, decision making exactly the way Australia went through? Um, I think uh, 16th of December uh, last year, we had um, uh, a final discussion on, uh, I think, sixth round of discussion. Do we really no need to go through to that bus? Maybe we can finish it off by this much because already we are facing this sort of a threat because already USA, the great superpower, one of the greatest superpowers, they are being threatened by China, none other than China, uh, and by their imperialistic thoughts. Uh, I just would like to know your thoughts on this. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the question. So I think, I think firstly, the, um, what we've seen over the last week or so with the um, so-called spy balloons really demonstrates that uh, the global great power competition that, that I've talked about and that is set out in our integrated view is only increasing. And um, these things need to be managed carefully so that they don't uh, escalate. <coughs> I think on the on the China point, I would just say that um, in terms of how the UK views the the China relationship, and I think it's similar to India, there are huge trade dependencies with China, um, and obviously economic cooperation with China is vital. But not only that, cooperation with China in 
uh, the multilateral space to solve the pressing climate problems that we all face is also vital. So that relationship needs to be managed very carefully. And there are obviously challenges to, to China's rise, um, but uh, that we, we also need to maintain a, a working relationship with China. Um, on the point about uh, the FTA negotiations, uh, I think the, the reason why they are continuing to be talked through is to make sure that they re it really unlocks a, uh, a step change in how trade and investment works between our two countries. I think um, the, the new prime minister, when he came in, was very clear that we want to sort of do it right and not rush to, to an agreement that's not going to really change um, the, the game in terms of trade. So it's worth continuing to negotiate. And I think there was a very successful round of negotiations that just took place last week in London. And I think watch this space. I think uh, things are progressing well. So hopefully we will deliver that step change agreement very shortly. Thanks. Uh, well. Uh to contain China, etc. So this has been going on for the last uh, many years. And at one point of time I said that all right, it's fine. We would also like to, you know, compete with China, maybe engage with them and do better than them. But the point is that the, why the Americans are so much interested. Chinese have the largest investment in America and the Americans have the largest investment in China. Now the two countries would not fight. This is my understanding. Now the Britishers now they have also, they are of course, they have always been part of anything and everything in the world. But at times they, uh, they forget their, uh, you know, uh, where their place is. I am very glad that uh, two of their representatives are going to speak. And both of them actually, they have hold positions related to uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific. Good. Germans are doing much better. They have actually got in this Indo-Pacific bandwagon because they have deep pocket. And Britain has got exposed. You know why? Because of that Brexit. Earlier, if Germany, France, Britain, all of them doing something, then it is fine because it is the EU doing it. Now the Britain has to be singled out separately and what they are doing, I'm sorry uh, that they are not doing enough. But I'm very glad that the British High Commission and the Deputy High Commission in our country and in Kolkata, they have started taking note of these developments and they are very active. So th uh, thank you very much. For that. But do, do compete with them. Now the last question. And this is something, you know, Dr. Yom and Swabhushachi Dotto and people like Professor Somit Das who has, and Srirada Dotto, both of them they have written books on Northeast India. Northeast. Every. Have you ever th thought of Pondicherry as South India? No. Or Goa, would you say is, uh, uh, Western India and like that? No, you will not say. Not even uh, Uttarakhand, Himachal and so on. And Jharkhand is a, is a new uh, state. Manipur is very old. One of the oldest, in fact. And so is Nagaland and so on. But then you know why we use the term Northeast? Because Generally speaking, it is very difficult to know the name and the capital city and the chief minister's name of the each of the northeastern states. Actually, this is it. And that is how, I, because there is so much of differences among the northeastern, so-called northeastern states. So at one point of time, I had very seriously proposed and there, there is no embargo on me because it is more than 10 years when I was in the, with the Prime Minister's National Security Advisory Board not to uh, popularize this term Northeast and not to have a separate ministry 
of the northeast and so on anyway and I, as always i was defeated my suggestion was rejected but then i think this is going to be important when each of these states they try to relate to uh, the, uh, the policies under so called uh, what is that uh, act east now uh, uh, act east or uh, look east and so on so uh, uh, well each of the states they actually have to relate to the uh, promises and the challenges differently their situations are different i will conclude here but just to add we are too selfish to be fighting each other so we are not going to go to war we can keep on preparing for the war but then we are too selfish to go to war and since it is essentially a political science international relations audience let me take you back all to why we had the state and the best answer was uh, has been given by hops in the leviathan that we have reason and reasoning so therefore we are not going to fight so in between since all of us have 24 hours 365 days and we are living for 70 years even in our own country only 100 years back indians they used to die at the age of 21 average death now it is 70 in britain i suppose it's uh, 80 russia it might be 85 or uh, uh, J uh, japanese so so we have lot of time we should keep on preparing for it but then we are too intelligent not to actually get into a war and so therefore let us all think in terms of economic interdependence uh, which is the best pathway for the future thank you thank you so much distinguished panelists for such an intriguing and informative session before moving on to the second half of the day May I request all the esteemed delegates and faculty members to kindly proceed for lunch at the Department of International Relations and all the participants and students are requested to collect their food packets from the counter outside the hall. Thank you. The next session will sharp begin from 2 p.m. onwards. Uh, one small announcement for the students here. You are requested to kindly re-register through the re-registration form circulated by the registration desk.